Lecture 19, Deadlock Detection and Recovery. So, it has come to this. We've examined, uh, in a few cases, how we might prevent deadlock, how we might avoid deadlock, and ultimately we have been forced to conclude that that's difficult to impossible. Um, every solution comes with significant drawbacks or limitations. Sometimes it's we have to know the future. Sometimes it is we require the operating system's help and it's just you know, not giving it to us. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily possible to do what we want. So that leaves us with um, only, only really one thing left. Uh, and that is deadlock detection. Uh, and that is if we can't stop it, uh, and if we're not willing to pay the price uh, for uh, an avoidance algorithm that's very conservative, i.e. one that it will prevent a request from taking place, even if there's only a very small chance of a deadlock, then the next best thing is we just let everything happen and we'll try to determine later if a deadlock exists. If we detect that a deadlock exists, then there are some actions we could take to recover from that situation, hence why the topic is deadlock detection and recovery. Uh, and that being the case, we can hopefully find a way to uh, get out of that jam. So uh, in the words of Sherlock Holmes, uh, elementary, my dear Watson, we just need to um, find the problem. And if we find it, maybe we can fix it. Right. Um, our strategy is, well, kind of like deadlock avoidance. Um, but it comes with certain limitations. The truth of the matter is, is that the operating system is actually in the best position to uh, make a determination about detecting whether or not there is a deadlock, but commercial operating systems don't. Other ones maybe do, um, but you know, uh, for the most part, the ones that we deal with just don't. With that in mind, um, so we're going to operate, unfortunately, from a position of only partial information. Um, and we can do it ourselves in our program or programs, you know, because if we have control over them, we can monitor it. Um, we won't have the full picture because we can't see what's going on inside other processes or inside the kernel, because you know, those are the operating system's purview. So yeah, we're uh, a little bit out of luck in that regard, but we'll do the best we can. Now our basic strategy for deadlock detection is somewhat like deadlock avoidance uh, in that we have a model based on resource allocation and requests, so we'll have something like a resource allocation graph uh, and we will use that as the basis for analyzing. Notably, uh, this is not a what-if analysis, it is just an analysis of the state of the system as it presently is, uh, and there are no claim edges because claim edges only exist when we are uh, informed in advance of things that processes will want. Uh, and that's, well, we've already agreed that's not realistic. Now, if we are looking at a resource allocation graph uh, and all resources only have a single instance, you can reduce the graph down to a simplified version, which is called the wait for graph. It removes the resource boxes from the diagram because uh, when you have only one instance of each resource, if you say P1 is waiting for R1, which is currently assigned to P2, you could skip that middle step and you could say, well, process uh, P1 is waiting for process P2. Same thing, uh, it just, you know, notational shorthand, uh, a, little less, uh, a little less repetition. So yeah, um, in edge, formally speaking, uh, from process I to process J exists in the wait for graph, if and only if the resource allocation graph has a request PI to RK and an assignment edge from RK to PJ. So yeah, on the left, labeled as A, we have a standard resource allocation graph, which has processes one, two, three, four, and five, uh, and it accordingly has resources, uh, but you can crush that down a little bit to a wait for graph, which makes it a little bit nicer, a little bit easier to read, a little bit easier to follow. Uh, especially if you have a large number of processes and a large number of resources, we've effectively reduced the number of nodes in the graph, which would make things like cycle finding algorithms faster. You know, your typical um, your typical finding algorithm, we're looking at you know, n squared kind of behavior for detecting if there's a cycle in the graph. Uh, and if you can reduce the size of n, in this case, you know, basically cut it down by half, um, we would 
save time in actually executing that kind of algorithm. Okay, so I mean, is there a cycle in the graph? I mean, yes, we can see fairly easily on both of them that there is in fact a cycle. Uh, and that's, um, you know, I don't think super surprising at this point. But you might also see that it's a little easier to detect a cycle, uh, just even visually in the wait for graph B, uh, because uh, it's, you know, fewer lines that you have to follow uh, and it makes it a little more straightforward okay so yeah I mean given this graph you know it's fairly trivial for humans to look at it and determine if there's a cycle um, it is straightforward uh, for the computer it takes more work but it's a solved problem so there you know, exist algorithms to do this you don't have to invent your own um, but if a cycle exists in the wait for graph that actually tells us that there is a deadlock in the system. So now it's actually predictive. Previously in a resource allocation graph, a cycle doesn't necessarily imply a deadlock because a resource allocation graph allows for you know, resources that have more than one instance. Uh, and we've seen a couple of examples of that. A wait for graph is different in that there cannot be resources with more than one instance, otherwise you can't make it a wait for a graph. Uh, and therefore, if we have one and there is a cycle in it, such as in this one here with P1, P2, P3, P4, back to P1, that indicates we have a deadlock. So yeah, if our situation does you know, have only resources with one instance, the uh, wait for graph is not only faster, but it allows us to determine if there is actually formally a deadlock. So that's kind of nice. Um, and again, uh, the cycle detection algorithms have a worst case runtime of uh, n squared, n being the number of nodes in the graph. The premise of such an algorithm is like for each node, examine every possible path. Uh, if a node is reached from which no further path is available, just go on to the next one. Uh, if the starting node is reached on the current path, the cycle is detected, and then the algorithm will terminate. You can say, yep, we found one, the end. Okay, so that's the resource allocation graph slash uh, wait for graph version of detecting deadlock. It is, of course, not the only one. Uh, we're also going to learn about the general deadlock detection algorithm. Uh, and uh, this, uh, well, being general, allows for multiple resources of each type. Uh, and it does not require you know, only one resource of each type. And it's not a graph-based algorithm. So as you might imagine, there are n processes, however many there are in the system, and m resources. Uh, resources are represented by two vectors, E the existing and A the available. Uh, and if a resource has two instances and one is currently assigned, then E at index I will be two and A at index I will be one. And we will have two matrices or little tables to represent the current situation of the system. The first is C, the current allocation. Uh, and row I of C shows how many uh, of each resource a process PI has. So uh, if this is process two, it's the, the row two in the table. And, uh, and it tells you, OK, process two has these following resources. The second matrix is R, the request matrix. That is, these are outgoing requests that you know, have not yet been fulfilled. Uh, and, uh, and if you uh, look at any individual square in your table, uh, or any individual cell in your table, C, I, uh, and J says, you know, at row I, column J, it says the number of instances of resource J that process I has, and in the request matrix, R at I and J shows the number of instances of the resource J that this uh, process has requested. Okay, so general deadlock detection algorithm, if you lay it out, you know, for a given example, looks something like this. We have you know, all the resources in existence. Those are you know, uh, resource one's maximum, resource two maximum, so on and so on. Uh, resources available shows what is currently not allocated. Uh, and then we have a, a little matrix or table for your current allocations. Uh, and you have a little matrix or table for requests. Uh, and the math thing at the bottom says that like for every I, the uh, Current allocations plus the available equals the existing, which again just says that you know, things don't disappear. They have to be somewhere. Either they're assigned or they're not assigned, but they can't you know, be mysteriously nowhere. Now you might be looking at this and you might say it looks a little bit familiar. Does it? 
Okay, there's one more uh, thing. To aid in the uh, description of what the algorithm does and how you execute the general detect lock, de lock detection algorithm, uh, I want to define for notational convenience some sort of less than operator for two vectors. Uh, and I would say two vectors a and b of length m, uh, we would say a is less than or equal to b, uh, if at every position uh, for all i from 1 to m, a at index i is less than or equal to b at index i. Okay, so run the algorithm. Well, in the beginning, all processes are unmarked. The vectors and matrices are populated. Fine. Uh, search for an unmarked process whose request can be satisfied with the available resources in A. That is, you know, find a process PI such that rho uh, R of I is less than A, the available vector. If such a process is found, add the allocated resources of that process to the available vector and mark the process. So, you know, just draw a line through it. So mathematically, A is uh, A plus C I. Go back to step one. Uh, if no process is found in the search for step one, we're done. Uh, at the end, either all processes have uh, had a line drawn through them and they're finished, uh, or uh, if there are any remaining, they are deadlocked. Um, so yeah, you have probably figured out that this is basically the banker's algorithm. So I told you the banker's algorithm and we talked about it in the context of deadlock avoidance. And then after all that, and after all the uh, effort and everything that goes into what I told you, actually it's useless. Sort of. It's useless for avoidance, but it's actually reasonable for detection. Uh, because you know, in avoidance, the limiting factor was we had to know in advance what are all of the possible requests. Uh, and then you know, we would uh, do a what if calculation. We say, like, if we granted this request, does it cause the potential for a problem? Now we're not concerned about that. All we're interested in is figuring out does the deadlock presently exist? Uh, and, well, that's a lot easier because it doesn't require us to know anything about future resource requests. It doesn't require us to know anything about you know, um, anything from the future, really. Um, all that is necessary is to look at the current state of the system, and that's something we can know. You know if resources magically disappear, well, it changes the current state of the system. You know, if uh, more processes get started, it changes the current state. Those things are not predictable, but once they've happened, they're accounted for in our actual state of the process. So that's okay. Uh, and yeah, ultimately we are just executing the banker's algorithm. So look for a process that can run to completion. We're certain we're able to do it because the available resources are equal to or exceed its needs. The process can finish. When it does so, its currently held resources are released and available for another process, uh, and so on and so on. And yeah, everything uh, works, well, just like the banker's algorithm. Uh, only this one is actually possible to implement. Now, one of the bad things about this is the runtime performance of this algorithm, uh, in the worst case, is m times n squared, m, again, being number of resource types, uh, and n being the number of processes in the system. So that makes it um, quite expensive to actually execute. So just to give another sort of brief example, if we have four types of resources and three processes, we have something like this. Um, honestly, the names and the types of the resources don't really matter. I mean, in the last example, you know, we had four printers for some reason, but uh, the, these could be anything. Um, and you know, each uh, process has some resources currently allocated and some requests outstanding. So our current state of the system looks like this. Well, what do we do? Well, we look at the available vector uh, and the uh, request vector, and you know, are there any processes that we can make happy with the available resources? Sure. Uh, the third one in the table has exactly the requests that match what is available, so let's do that. Uh, so we could cross out process three and add its resources from the C matrix back to the available vector, so A would be then uh, zero, two, two, zero. Uh, no, sorry, it'd be two, 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 zero. Uh, and then we'll look at you know, the other requests. You know, well, what can we satisfy with that? Oh, well, you know, now we have enough for um, process two uh, because you know, it will uh, have everything it needs and we can draw a line through it. And as with the banker's algorithm, once we've got it down to um, 
once we've got it down to one remaining process, we can just say, yep, we're done. Uh, we know we will be able to satisfy the, uh, the last process, uh, and we have determined that this is not deadlocked by finding a safe sequence. Uh, and so everything we learned about how to find a safe sequence applies here. So you would say, well, um, you know, the order in which we're, we're going to run it is this, and then we're done. That's straightforward. You know, just three, then two, then one. That's our safe sequence. No deadlock. Uh, and everything is great. Uh, as a sanity check, uh, just to make sure that you didn't make any math mistake on the way, if you have been updating your A vector while you do the solution, uh, it should match the E vector. That's um, helpful uh, in just like double checking. You know, if you add it all up and at the end you get 4231, then you know that you didn't make any mistake somewhere and you know, accidentally put a thing in the wrong column or you know, fail to add two numbers correctly, as I did earlier in this example, because math is hard. Apparently. Okay. Um, there's one more uh, deadlock detection algorithm that I want to cover, and to some extent it's the mirror image, uh, you know, the evil twin of the uh, ignore it uh, deadlock handling problem, which is the assumption algorithm. Uh, and that is, if we started uh, some operation and it's taking too long, we could just assume that a deadlock has occurred and then we'll take action based on that assumption. Um, yeah, in the words of Zoidberg, your assumption is bad and you should feel bad. Um, because uh, does that mean it's deadlocked? Well, I don't know. Like We didn't conclude necessarily that it is deadlocked. It might just be very slow or there might be other reasons why it's taking longer than expected. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, from the perspective of the user, the user might not care. All they care about is that it's stuck uh, and we want to restart it. You have probably found that when something is stuck, restarting it usually fixes it. Uh, and that might be sufficient for this situation. You might be okay with that. This does mean we might declare a deadlock when there really isn't one. You know, that's a possibility. Um, this is a trade-off that we may have to accept because we don't necessarily have full information about the system. Uh, we don't have information about the state of all the threads, all the processes, so we can't know for sure what is being used by what. Uh, and therefore, we'll just do the best we can. One way to implement this is via a watchdog timer. Uh, before you start something that might get deadlocked or might get stuck, you also begin a timer. So you like, start another thread and you put that thread to sleep. Uh, and when the uh, task is finished, it cancels the timer thread. Uh, if the uh, timer fires, you know, that is uh, the thread wakes up or uh, some other uh, event is triggered, then deadlock is assumed and we take a resolution action. So that's one way to, uh, to deal with it, is that you just assume that if a certain amount of time has passed, and that's implemented using a watchdog timer, deadlock occurred, so we better do something about it. All right, but uh, other than uh, just assuming that it's happened based on some timeout, you could think about when do you want to detect deadlock. If you're looking at a resource allocation graph type algorithm, you know, we have worst case n squared behavior. The general deadlock detection algorithm is m times n squared. Um, so ultimately, detecting deadlock is fairly expensive. This prompts a question of how often should this deadlock detection algorithm be run? And uh, that's a uh, you know, system design decision, I suppose. One strategy is every time a resource is requested, find out if doing that put us in deadlock. That's probably too expensive. Um, that probably uh, puts us in uh, slowing down our system tremendously kind of position, so we don't like that. Um, alternatively, you know, only run when a resource request cannot be granted. That is, you know, a process gets blocked because a resource request gets granted. You know, deadlock didn't start right then. So you know, maybe if a, a thread gets blocked or a process gets blocked, uh, but even then that might be very frequently. Uh, an obvious uh, uh, alternative idea is you just run it periodically. You say, well, you know, every so often I'll just check and see has the deadlock occurred. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't, um, but you wouldn't want to do it uh, too much. How much is too much? Well, when to run it depends on two factors. Number one, how often we expect deadlock to occur. And number two, how severe of a problem it is if a deadlock does actually happen. If deadlock happens a lot, then checking frequently makes sense. 
if the consequences of deadlock are severe, it makes sense to check frequently to identify the problem as soon as possible. You know, if this is a, a critical system, uh, then checking to detect if there's a deadlock is meaningful. You know, if it's a life and safety system, then you don't want there to be a deadlock. That would be a real problem if the deadlock prevents it from fulfilling its life and safety critical function. Uh, and so with that in mind, you might therefore choose to run deadlock detection quickly uh, or frequently to detect the problem quickly. Another idea is run it when uh, CPU utilization is low. Not only because it's not a bad time, um, but also uh, because, well, if CPU utilization is low, the system is not very busy. And one of the reasons why it might not be very busy is that many processes are stuck and cannot proceed. Uh, and therefore, a drop in CPU usage could be a potential indication that many processes are deadlocked. Okay, now, however we have gone about detecting a deadlock, you know, whether it's speculative or whether we're certain. If we found it, the goal is just to do something about it. Um, you know, detecting it on its own isn't particularly useful. It should be coupled with, like, actually taking some action. Uh, and, uh, well, you know, it's, uh, as you may be familiar with from Star Trek or any other science fiction show, you know, if we just send a tachyon beam on the correct subspace harmonic, we can reverse the polarity, it'll bounce the anti-graviton beam off the main deflector dish, uh, all that sort of, uh, I believe the term is technobabble. Uh, you know, allows us to you know, somehow magically solve whatever problem we have uh, in this week's episode. But yeah, I mean, what do we do? Well, we can recover from deadlock by breaking it. Uh, and what do I mean by breaking it? Well, breaking it comes from, the, you know, there's a log jam, so to speak. You know, you were trying to you know, send logs down a river or something for, like, maximum, you know, forestry. And um, if, if they're jammed up somewhere, uh, you can unjam them by breaking the log that's holding all the other ones up. So I think that's where this sort of thing comes from. But I guess it's another example of how computer metaphors are perhaps unnecessarily violent. Like, yeah, we're smashing that thing. Mm -hmm. you know, we shoot targets and you know, we kill processes and we break deadlock. Like, yeah, we smash things. Very aggressive. Uh, but actually what we're thinking about is a recovery strategy. And a recovery strategy is a way of dealing with the problem. Uh, it's possible, of course, to have a manual form of deadlock recovery where an operator is notified and that person is responsible for sorting out the problem. You know, they uh, just get an alert of some sort and then they're responsible for investigating and choosing what to do. That's fine, but it doesn't really require any further discussion. Now, the, the goal of uh, our uh, topic here is to think about ways that the system can deal with the problem automatically, although in principle a uh, human operator could apply some of these uh, directly, so we're not really missing out by not spending a lot of time talking about this is how you manually fix the problem. So there are several strategies that we could apply We'll refer to them actually in humorous terms in the hopes that it makes it a little more memorable for you. Any one of the solutions that we're going to choose are potentially valid, uh, and some of them are more complex and some of them are less complex. Uh, unfortunately, none of the solutions are particularly pleasant. Once we've gotten into a deadlock, there's very rarely a magic solution which uh, solves everything. Um, Whatever solution we choose, there is a risk of data loss, uh, delays in completion of programs or tasks, or some other problems, you know, other side effects, which are undesirable. So ideally, we break the deadlock with as little disruption as possible, uh, and that means that we should try to choose you know, less disruptive uh, strategies first, uh, and you know, then escalate if we need to. Uh, and some of the strategies require us to choose a victim. Uh, that also requires choosing carefully. Uh, you know, not every process is equally good uh, as a candidate for every strategy. Uh, and our strategies are not mutually exclusive, uh, so any system could implement some or all of them uh, as ways of you know, getting out of deadlock. So our first one. Any idea what uh, 
what this one is about. Uh, if uh, you recognize the movie that uh, this is, well, the remake movie that this is, then uh, yeah, our first strategy is robbery. And robbery is just a humorous way of saying preemption. Um, the idea is virtually the same as our discussion earlier about knocking down the pillar of deadlock for deadlock prevention. The key difference is that recovery is run only when deadlock is detected and not as some sort of preventative measure. Um, suppose a process P1 you know, needs a resource R1 and you know, has another resource and you know, we could steal the, uh, we could block a process and steal its resources and give it to another process and what have you. So the operating system would have to do this, and it would have to choose a victim to rob. We're going to talk about victim selection criteria uh, in just a little bit. But of course, the resource has to be of an appropriate type for preemption to occur. Uh, most of them are, are not suitable for this, so it has to be possible to save and restore the state. Uh, otherwise, this doesn't do what we need it to do. Um, so, yeah, we could block a process, you know, take this resource away, give it back when we're done. If we're the operating system, we don't really have that option. You know, preemption of a printer is not realistic. Uh, preemption of memory is not great. Um, you know, access to a network might be, a CPU might be. Uh, but again, it requires the resource to be of a type where the state can be saved and restored. Uh, and we know that is not the case for every resource. So, okay, robbery is you know, kind of clever if you can get away with it, but um, unlikely to be a uh, practical solution. Well, next one, kill them all. You can probably imagine what this strategy is like, yeah? Yeah, it is terminate or kill all of the processes that are involved in the deadlock. Well... That gets the job done. There's no more deadlock. I mean, sure, um, this goes against our wishes for, you know, maybe choose a, a minimally disruptive uh, solution. But hey, you know, this is actually surprisingly common. Processes A, B, and C are deadlocked. Yep, shoot them all dead. There will be no more deadlock after that. Uh, you know, the resources that these processes were holding will become available, uh, and this has the advantage of no requirement to determine a victim. You don't have to look at which processes are involved in the deadlock and then make a decision about which one we're going to select or anything like that. You know, we're going to rob what resource from what process. Um, skip all that, kill them all, and let Root sort them out. Does it work? I mean, yes, but also maybe no. It's easy to implement, but it might not actually solve the problem, because the circumstances that cause the deadlock might occur again. If deadlock happened, you know, because of unlucky timing, then it probably doesn't happen again, at least straight away. Um, but you know, it could, uh, could recur at some point. Now, uh, it, the problem, of course, with killing all the processes is uh, if they're going to get restarted, it sends them all back to one, and you know, then we might just sort of end up facing this problem again a little bit later. Um, and, yeah, this is you know, much more disruptive than other choices. So you could think of, you know, if process P1 and P2 are deadlocked, is it necessary to kill both? If you kill only one of them, then the other one could proceed. You know, they would be able to get the resources held by the now deceased process. So could we be more selective? Hello, Clarice. Did you know that uh, Anthony Hopkins is only in Silence of the Lambs for, I think, it's 11 minutes of its runtime, and yet he still won some award, might have been an Academy Award for it? So, uh, I don't know, mass murder is so gauche. Maybe we could be uh, a little more discerning in our tastes. <laughs> so perhaps instead of killing all processes involved in deadlock, we choose carefully. Like preemption, uh, which one we choose is important. Uh, when a victim process is terminated, uh, its resources are you know, made available again, uh, and this hopefully allows other processes to proceed. Uh, but you might still have to run the deadlock detection algorithm again to see if this solved the problem. Uh, it's tempting to think that like choosing exactly one 
uh, would solve it, but you're not actually guaranteed that. It is entirely possible you might have to kill more than one, depending on how you choose which processes uh, are, are the ones that have an accident. Now, uh, this presumably kills fewer processes than the uh, mass murder strategy. Why? Because ultimately, if there are n processes involved in the deadlock, uh, mass murder kills all of them, but uh, murder kills you know, somewhere between one and all of them minus one, uh, which is presumably fewer uh, than uh, would otherwise be killed. So yeah, it's less disruptive uh, at the cost of it takes more work to figure out which processes should be uh, should be selected as the uh, unlucky ones. And then the next idea is time travel. Yeah, time travel. It's quite simple, um, right? Why why not just you know go back in time and avoid the problem in the first place? Well, sort of. Um, time travel comes with consequences, like you know Biff being president. Um, yeah. Um, rollback is uh, what this is actually known as, you know, more formally, um, because, uh, well, what is rollback? It is returning the state of a process to a saved state from an earlier time. Uh, and you're familiar with this all the time, you know, suppose you are playing a game involving a plumber who's good at jumping, uh, and you miss a jump and he falls down a pit, uh, and, you know, lose a life. Uh, you can resume from a saved state, and the saved state might be the start of the level that you're currently on, uh, or it might be a midpoint uh, in the level, something like that. Uh, and that is you know, a checkpoint. Uh, this requires, of course, that there is a saved state that was created in advance, so you know, automatically when you start a, a new level, uh, there is some sort of uh, checkpoint. Um, if you encounter a checkpoint in a level, that's usually you know, announced to you in some way, uh, in which case you know, some work is done to save the state, so you can go back there. Um, in your program, there has to exist a saved state, uh, otherwise you know, there's no way to roll back because you, know, you can't go back to a state that is lost. Uh, so a saved state is frequently referred to as a checkpoint, uh, and the act of creating and saving a checkpoint is called checkpointing because, hey, there is nothing that you cannot turn into a, uh, a verb. Uh, as the uh, Calvin and Hobbes comic says, verbing weirds language. Um, checkpoints could be created periodically, so you know every so often there is a checkpoint uh, before beginning some particular operation is also an option. Um, so as we discussed earlier when we talked a, a long time ago now about um, asynchronous processing and how Microsoft Word will save a copy of your document you know, in its partial completion state so that if something happens, if there's a crash, it can be recovered. That would be a checkpoint, and a checkpoint is something that is done periodically. So, okay, that will work. Um, so you might actually be familiar with um, checkpoints uh, from other contexts as well. Now, for a process, if you really want to do this you know, completely and fully, it's actually quite extensive. We have to save the memory image, the call stack, the resource state of the process, everything like that. Uh, and it's written to disk uh, and persists as long as the process executes. Um, in the extreme case, you have to you know, dump all the memory of the process and save that as your copy. In a less extreme state, you can uh, write down enough information to get you back to where you were before, uh, which is you know, effectively how a save game works, if you, you know, save a game. Uh, it's not that you dump the entire memory of the, uh, of the game, that could actually be quite significant. Um, what you would do instead is write down enough information so that you could put everything back to where it was. So, you know, what was the state of your character? Where were you standing? What is your health? Um, what mission objectives have been completed in this level? That kind of thing uh, will be saved. And it's not a complete record, but it's enough to um, go back to where we were. Um, and rollbacks also occur in other situations. Uh, if you've used version control software like Subversion or Git, uh, a previous state of the source code is saved. If you commit a change that is somehow detrimental, uh, then a change can be undone by reverting the state of the source files to an earlier version. Uh, of course, it's usually better practice to you know, uh, revert it by you know, putting a negative commit 
that undoes the previous commit, but rollback will happen if we are attempting to commit to the repository and you know, somebody else is doing the same at the same time. Now, um, rollbacks are also super common in databases. Um, after we have finished our, uh, at this point, rather lengthy digression on the subject of deadlock, uh, we're going to talk about the model that databases use for uh, concurrency control. Uh, and to, to give you sort of a hint and maybe give you something to think about in advance of that, uh, is while locks are possible in a deadlock, they're not usually your first choice. Uh, we usually try to do our operations without locking strange as that might sound, uh, and we'll find out you know, what is the strategy, how does that work uh, when we get there. But we have to get through uh, a bit more discussion of deadlock uh, and then a bit more about sort of general concurrency type stuff before that happens. But anyway, um, databases do a rollback strategy. If an attempted modification fails for some reason, you know, we try to add data to the database, um, but you know, some data is too large for the field that it's going to go into. You know, we, we're trying to put a name and somebody has uh, put a super long name in there. Um, then yeah, that change is not going to succeed. You know, why doesn't it succeed? Well, because the, uh, the name is too long, it can't be stored on the table, uh, and a rollback will occur, which puts things back to the state they were before any attempted change uh, has happened. Now, um, those familiar with uh, you know, time travel uh, science fiction TV shows, uh, Doctor Who being one of them, maybe even Star Trek, that kind of thing, rollback doesn't always succeed. Uh, time travel seems like it might be the solution to all your problems, but it's actually not, um, because uh, sometimes moving a process back to an earlier state just you know, puts it a few steps back on the same road that leads to the deadlock. Right, that you can try this, uh, and you know we go back in time, but uh, the uh, the fate of the uh, uh, of the process has already been determined, and we'll just end up in the same deadlock again. Maybe not. Um, maybe when it runs through a second time, a different ordering of events uh, or requests or what have you will happen, and you know the problem is avoided. Um, so you might attempt rollback a couple of times before you give up and try another strategy. Our last strategy, Armageddon. Armageddon, the end of the world. If a deadlock has occurred, sometimes what you actually do to get out of that situation is reboot the system. This, of course, kills all processes, innocent or guilty though they may be, uh, whether they're in the deadlock or not, um, but it is sometimes the best way to make sure that the system is in a valid state. Um, you know, this is super disruptive. There's no getting around that. Um, but yeah, um, NASA Spirit Rover uh, relies on this strategy. If it detects a deadlock, you know, this is a, a mission to explore Mars. Um, it's not easy to, uh, you know, diagnose and, uh, and treat whatever problems are, uh, are going on in the software when the system is located on another planet. You know, you can't just send a technician out even if the technician in question is Matt Damon. You know, so um, if a deadlock is detected, it reboots the entire system. Um, there's some fun stories uh, which you can read uh, about the uh, Mars rover uh, in involving you know, priority inversions and you know, tasks getting... Uh, tasks getting delayed, uh, which result in a reboot of the system and potentially the loss of some collected data. Um, we're not going to go into too much detail about that here, um, but I just want to introduce the idea that you know, if you reboot the system, that could be a solution, even though it is quite disruptive. Uh, but it is a great way to make sure the system is in a known good state, uh, and if ever, of course, you are you know, having some sort of computer problem, uh, or if, uh, if a, a parent or relative is having a computer problem, it is likely that one of the first things you suggest to them is, you know, have you tried rebooting? it might just fix it. Okay, so we've got our strategies. Some of them require choosing a victim and some of them don't. Um, but if we have to choose one, um, then we should try to have a strategy for how we make that decision. Um, now, you could choose randomly. Um, one, of those, uh, one of those things that I always uh, recommend 
if we're considering you know, courses of action, you might say, well, uh, we should consider take no action, you know, the do nothing option. Um, sometimes it's better than you know other choices, uh, or at least it's worth having a rationale as to why you don't do it. Uh, and the same is true of you know, when making a choice. So is choosing randomly a valid option? I mean, maybe. Um, you could consider it, even if it's just to say, yeah, actually, this option sucks. Um, then at least you, know, you haven't overlooked anything. Um, but in this case, I will imagine that making an informed decision is better. And you can think of it as being kind of an optimization problem. Um, in one of those weird situations, it's sometimes not necessary to choose one of the processes involved in a deadlock. Um, you can sometimes kill a process uh, that frees up other ones. Um, it wasn't technically a deadlock. Uh, because, of course, uh, if P3 can run to completion and it can exit, uh, then P1 and P2 will be uh, able to continue. But if our assumption algorithm or other algorithm has detected that uh, P1 and P2 are stuck, then sometimes killing an innocent process allows those processes to proceed sooner than they otherwise would. Um, again, it's not really actually solving a deadlock, um, but uh, it, uh, it does allow processes that are otherwise blocked to continue. So if we uh, think of a cost function, uh, you know, evaluate it, choose the uh, lowest cost, and here are some factors to consider in your decision. So one is the priority of a given process. Um, generally speaking, you don't want to kill high priority processes. You know, they're high priority for a reason. So letting them finish their execution is, uh, is wise. Um, you know, that's... Uh, it doesn't have to be a hard rule, but it can uh, it can make sense. Uh, how long a process has been executing? This is one of those where it can sort of go both ways, uh, depending on what you think will happen in your particular system. Uh, if you kill a process that has really only just started, uh, it has to restart from the beginning, but the amount of work that's lost is fairly small. Uh, and if you kill a process that's been running for a long time and it has to restart, then the amount of work that uh, has to be redone is fairly large, so you wouldn't want to redo more than you have to do. Uh, on the other hand, a process that's been running for a very long time and has accumulated a lot of resources might be the villain in this story, in which case killing that process makes everybody else happy. Uh, how long is remaining in execution if known? Uh, this is similar to how long the process has been executing. Uh, if it has been executing for a long time uh, and it's nearly done, you might prefer to let it finish to reduce the amount of work that has to restart. Um, if it is nowhere near finished, so it's only just begun, then restarting it reduces the uh, amount of pain. Uh, an amount of repetition. Um, what resources the process has, the number and the type, you know, if it is a process that's only holding on to one resource, but it's a critical one that everybody else needs, uh, then you might consider saying, well, oh, that's uh, bad news for you. Uh, or if it is a mega process that has accumulated a lot of resources, you might say, well, this will unblock lots of other processes if we kill the big one. On the other hand, uh, any process that you know, has acquired a lot of resources has spent a lot of time and effort acquiring those. So you might, on that account, argue that um, no, it is better uh, if we do it the other way. Uh, and uh, a process that has a lot of resources is not selected for termination. Um, yeah, like I said, for a lot of them, you can argue them kind of both ways. Um, future resource requests, if known, uh, if process has nearly everything it needs, then you know, that's, again, sort of less rep uh, less repetitious if it doesn't have to do it all again. Uh, if it doesn't have uh, anything close to what it needs, then killing it probably doesn't do as much damage because it hasn't, uh, uh, it hasn't really been able to do what it needs to do yet. Uh, whether a process is user interactive or in the background, um, background processes, if they die, are not necessarily as noticeable to users. I mean, if you're using a client that interacts with it, uh, then you would probably notice. Uh, but if you are um, you know, looking at a, a graphical user interface program, you know, it's your web browser or something, and it dies on you, you will notice, even if it gets restarted, even if the state is restored, uh, and that feels kind of disruptive. Uh, if it is some background process that you don't normally see on your desktop, you don't normally interact with, then if it takes a nap and comes back, you won't be quite as... Uh, in fact, you probably won't even be aware of it, but if you are, you probably won't be quite as mad. 
Uh, and the last one, number seven, is uh, how many times, if any, this particular process has been selected as a victim. Uh, and the purpose of that is uh, to prevent starvation. Uh, it is likely that whatever algorithm you choose produces reasonably consistent results. Uh, and if it does, it might mean the same process uh, is repeatedly selected. Uh, and it means that uh, that process never actually gets a chance to run. Uh, so keeping in mind the number of rollbacks or terminations or what have you, uh, will uh, help to prevent, say, a low-priority process that takes a long time from never getting to finish. Now, um, selection routines tend to favor older processes rather than younger ones. That is to say, they likely kill younger processes and let older ones live. This is not because older processes vote in higher numbers, uh, although, you know, ad admittedly, um, you, know, uh, you should vote uh, if you are eligible. Uh, you know, at whatever time you're watching this, if there is a, an election, whether it is uh, you know, low level or highest office in the land kind of election, you should vote. Um, in the past couple offerings of, of this course, uh, there have been actual elections that sort of happen in the same term as this, so it's been uh, interesting to talk about it. Um, but yeah, you should vote. Um, yes, I know we're digressing. Sorry. Uh, you should vote because uh, you might think that politicians don't care about you, your constituency, or what you have to say, but you know, it's sort of self-reinforcing. They go where the votes are, uh, and uh, you know, if as a young person you vote, uh, even, even if your uh, preferred candidate doesn't win, you're sending a message that says, I'm a voter and you could get my vote if you would appeal to me. Now, processes don't vote on this, um, and you know, that's not, uh, not what really happens, uh, but the reason why these selection routines tend to favor these older processes is, again, because uh, we might have to do more work, uh, and it might be more expensive to restart uh, another uh, process uh, if it is a long-running one. So, um, yeah, um, if there's a, another... If there's another reason why this is the case, it's because of a different starvation problem. If old processes are constantly selected, then you know, that one might never run to completion. And if your killing routine is very aggressive, then actually processes that get old uh, are killed very quickly. Uh, and so nobody ever really gets to finish. Uh, and so younger processes tend to be the ones that are selected because it just reduces uh, significantly the possibility uh, that our system starves processes or that long-running processes never get to complete because they're constantly being interrupted in some way or another. Yeah, and uh, that is accounted for here where we uh, recap, you yeah, know, keeping track of the number of times a process has been victimized is valuable uh, to keep things from being totally unbalanced. Now, what about uh, miscarriage of justice? Thing is, um, our deadlock detection algorithm uh, can be somewhat conservative in that it tends to err on the side of saying there is a deadlock. Um, for a lot of them, we do a worst case analysis that says, well, if the process keep these resources until the end of execution, then you know, does this happen? Uh, deadlock avoidance had the same kind of thinking. Uh, it's a worst case scenario. The assumption algorithm uh, is definitely... Uh, capable of uh, delivering a miscarriage of justice uh, in that uh, we will d determine that there is a deadlock when there actually isn't one. So, um, yeah, what do we do? I mean, well, the, the outcome of that is that, you know, we have taken an action against a process in a system that's not actually deadlocked. Right? So we've detected that there was a deadlock and we killed a process and we restarted it even though it wasn't stuck and we didn't need to kill it. So what happens then? Um, well, it depends a lot on what the actual process is and what our recovery strategy is. So um, it's okay to make mistakes um, as long as our recovery strategy is appropriate. If killing a process and restarting it doesn't have unexpected side effects, then the selection doesn't really have an impact on the correctness of the program. So if it's you know, a uh, if it's a kind of program where we can do a rollback, uh, if we you know, select it for a rollback and we do the rollback unnecessarily. It takes a little longer, you know, some extra work was done, but in the end we got to the right result, you know, the, the correct values were put into the database, so, you know, nothing to worry about. 
Uh, if we kill a compiler, uh, you know, during a compilation, we restart compilation, maybe from the beginning or maybe from the stage of compilation that it was in, it means the compile takes longer to execute, but the binary as created is still correct. So there wasn't really any bad side effect. You know, it might be noticeable to the user that like, hey, the compile is taking longer than usual right now, but you wouldn't say, well, you know, this is definitely a problem. You know, um, the deadlock detection algorithm has ruined my day, has ruined my binary. Now, um, the strategy that we choose um, is very important in specifying uh, how costly mistakes are. And some mistakes are, are very costly. You know, if we uh, reboot the system, as was the case in the Mars uh, rover, that potentially results in the loss of some data. Now, you know, is that critical? You know, is that data you know, absolutely necessary? Is it super important? I mean, I guess not. Um, you know, no, nobody lives or dies based on what the Mars rover uh, finds uh, on the ground uh, of Mars. That's okay, but in other situations, you know, loss of data and more disruptive approaches uh, are kind of not okay. So we should um, consider at least uh, what is the cost of a miscarriage of justice, that is if we you know, uh, take action that we shouldn't be taking uh, against a process or thread that doesn't deserve it. <laughs> so the last thing that I want to talk about uh, in the subject of deadlock is uh, alternative to deadlock, uh, which is uh, li lifelock. No, uh, lifelock is uh, not quite right. Uh, this is a guy who is uh, the, I think, CEO of uh, of LifeLock, a company that promises that uh, you know they make it impossible for criminals to do bad things uh, if they have your social security number. Um, yeah, uh, your company is bad, and you should feel bad. Uh, but actually, what we want to talk about is LiveLock, uh, and LiveLock is similar to, but not exactly the same as Deadlock. Uh, and uh, this this was added actually uh, as a topic to the course uh, as a result of a number of questions that people had in particular uh, based on the recovery strategies. Uh, and so it's worth spending at least a little bit of time on. So live lock can occur in several ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be triggered by our deadlock recovery strategy, although you could imagine that this is a possibility and perhaps the most likely way that it happens. Uh, so, I mean, ideally, our recovery strategy is effective, and that means that, you know, the at least surviving threads uh, become capable of continuing. Unfortunately, the answer is no, because we just end up at the same impasse once again. You know, the action we took resolved the deadlock temporarily, you know, threads are able to proceed, but, you know, if we roll back uh, and you know, the, the same conflict happens and we get stuck again, um, you know, it, it doesn't... Um, doesn't solve anything, uh, and here we are again. Uh, and this could happen regardless of the action that we take for deadlock recovery, whether it's killing processes and restarting them, whether it's rollback, whether it, it is um, anything else. So there's, there's no magic uh, solution that will always solve the problem once and for all. Um, so you know, imagine, if you will, the dining philosophers for example. Um, if, if they use two-phase locking, um, each of them does the same steps at the same time, sort of in perfect synchronicity, pick up a chopstick, fail to get the other one, put the first chopstick down, go back to step one. They would all perform the same set of actions repeatedly, but nobody would ever get to the critical step of eat, uh, and they would be, you know, perfectly synchronized, making them look like they were in some sort of music video, right? You know, here they are all at the same time picking up the chopstick and then trying to get the other one and, you know, giving up and putting it down and starting again. Uh, and I, I mean, I guess that would be a cool music video of some sort, but um, not very practical for the philosophers who are going to try to eat, right? In this case, they go hungry, and I think they're probably unhappy about that. Now, um, that 
you know doesn't require any um, deadlock recovery strategy at all because that you know two phase locking we talked about uh, is a way of actually preventing deadlock by uh, avoiding a hold and wait kind of condition uh, where they are not holding onto a chopstick while waiting for another one. Um, so that's one way uh, you could imagine a, a similar situation arising with the dining philosophers where um, you know, they each pick up a chopstick, they all get deadlocked, uh, and our recovery strategy is we kill them all. Well, this got dark. Sorry. Uh, and then a new team of philosophers is brought in. You know, they're clones or uh, identical twins or something. Uh, and uh, they try the same thing and you know, at the exact same time they all try to pick up the chopstick and they all get stuck again and you know, here we are saying wait uh, what do we do now um, if you apply rollback you could get the same thing where if they all get stuck you could say okay you know, all philosophers you know, go back to the entrance you know, we're going to reset the table we're going to put all the chopsticks back where they were uh, and we're going to retake this from when the philosophers enter the room that's a rollback but again it could still lead to the same situation now, in real life, it is unlikely that any N threads executing on some general purpose operating system achieve this sort of perfect lockstep, right? Uh, there are uncertainties and you know, random things and uh, other behavior that's sort of outside your control that just add little tiny delays or you know, little adjustments uh, or different scheduling orders or what have you so that you don't always get exactly the same behavior uh, at where all the threads perform in perfect lockstep. That's more likely on, a, uh, on an embedded system uh, where you have uh, a lot fewer things going on. You know, the scheduling routine might be perfectly predictable. Uh, there won't be random interrupts caused by users typing on the keyboard uh, or by you know, incoming network data uh, that arrives you know, not perfectly synchronized. But in theory, um, you know, it is possible, uh, even though it's unlikely in a general purpose operating system. Um, it is more likely that live lock occurs with long running tasks. Um, and uh, you know, so random fluctuations in timing uh, or interrupts or the scheduler uh, eventually means that so somebody is uh, among the philosophers going to be lucky enough to get both chopsticks and eat. But as execution of tasks uh, are on longer time frames, you know, we are now um, doing bank transaction reconciliation so you know it's the end of the day and we have to sum up all of our foreign exchange transactions and then figure out okay you know in total um, you know this many people uh, were buying euro and this many people were selling euro for a net amount of this and you can work that out uh, but that's a long-running task possibly on the order of hours and not microseconds uh, and that may mean that deadlock will repeatedly occur uh, and you know, it will be detected, a recovery strategy runs, and we do the same thing that leads to the same problem again. So you know, we get one hour into uh, doing this process, uh, and a deadlock occurs, and you know, we get the same result. And on that kind of time frame, the random fluctuations of the scheduler uh, don't matter very much. You know, um, it, it matters when we're talking about what is the exact execution order of threads, but you know, we're talking about hours here when time slices are you know, tiny fractions of a second. So we can agree, I think, that um, you know, live lock is more likely to occur on a long-running task. Okay, with that said, um, you know, this is actually harder to detect than a deadlock is. Uh, and let's think for a minute about why. So if you'd like a, a hint, um, one of the things uh, that's important to note is to think about how we would detect deadlock, generally speaking. Maybe I'll clarify that a bit. Um, not just you know, how do we detect deadlock based on the strategies that we have so far, but you know, if, if you were given a set of processes and uh, you were asked to make a determination, are they deadlocked? What would you need to know about them? Uh, 
All right, so the thing about Deadlock uh, is that, well, whatever threads are involved in the Deadlock will be blocked, uh, and if you have an analysis tool of some sort, a debugger that you looked at this with, it would be able to tell you these are the threads that are, are uh, in the program, uh, these are the states of those current threads, uh, and you can look at the state and you can say, well, this one is blocked. Uh, and moreover, because the thread has its execution trace and everything, you can see, okay, it is blocked on this, let's say, wait on a semaphore. So that tells you something that, um, that you need to know, which is, you know, this thread is blocked waiting on the semaphore, and you can find other threads that are blocked on other things, and you can make a determination about whether there is a deadlock in this situation. With live lock, you don't get that same data, because as far as you can tell, you know, if you just you know, pause the state of execution and you look in the debugger, the state of the system is that these threads are running uh, and they're working and you know, they're executing some code. Now, it might be the case that you know, they're stuck in a loop because you know, they're trying to acquire the chopsticks and everything and that might be you know, spawnable uh, at a distance. However, uh, it might also be the case that it's fairly difficult to tell uh, if they are stuck. You know, oh, it's in this uh, function where it tries to acquire some resources, but you know, is it here for the first time or is it here for the hundredth time or the thousandth time? Uh, and if you look at CPU usage, you know, your CPU usage will tell you that you know, threads are running and they're doing work. Uh, and the only real indication is that uh, you know threads are executing, but no actual progress in the system is being made. And how easy it is to tell that progress is being made depends a lot on the kind of work that you're doing. You know, if, if you can you know see that there is some progress bar that you know goes up to 78% and then it jumps back a bit and you know goes up to 78 or something, that might tell you something interesting. But it is very hard to tell in some systems whether actual work is getting done or not. Uh, and so for this reason, uh, a well-designed recovery strategy will have some sort of limit uh, where it you know, stops retrying after a certain point. You know, if we are trying to uh, execute some database transaction and it rolls back again and again and again and again, we're just wasting our time if it's never going to succeed acknowledge this uh, and we need to do something different because what we're doing is just not working uh, and so that's uh, that's the reason why there's usually a limit uh, on these recovery strategies to prevent uh, repeated uh, repeated situations of live lock where we are frequently stuck so uh, this concludes uh, what has ultimately been a uh, rather lengthy digression on the subject of deadlock. Um, we started out by talking about the uh, three most common classical synchronization problems, producer, consumer, readers, writers problem, and dining philosophers. Uh, and dining philosophers led us into this rather long discussion about deadlock and live lock. Uh, and what it is and how you prevent it or avoid it or detect it uh, and you know, what you can do to deal with it if you found it. Um, but after this, we will resume uh, on the topic of synchronization problems. Uh, there are a number of advanced concurrency problems uh, you know, in the same vein as producer, consumer, uh, readers, writers, dining philosophers, uh, in that you know, we can sort of model uh, a... Uh, a problem that we're looking at in real life you know, on a co-op term on a job a fourth year design project something like that uh, in terms of one of these concurrency problems then we can say yeah um, I know how the synchronization is supposed to work so this big uh, deadlock digression is over uh, and we come back again in the next video uh, we will look at a few advanced concurrency problems that are not as classical as the big three see you then